Today marks the first Rambam Grand Rounds lecture in this new academic year. We are deeply honored and privileged to have a very special guest to mark this occasion. Please with me welcome Professor Sir Robert Jan Lechler. Sir, Le <laughs> Sir Lechler is the president of the British Academy of Medical Sciences, a nephrologist, immunologist, and academic. He specializes in transplantation tolerance and immunology. Since 2004, he is professor of immunology at King's College London, and he is the executive director of King's Health Partners since 2009. He studied at Moncton School, Victoria University of Manchester, in 1975, and the Royal Postgraduate Medical School in 1993. 83, sorry. Sir Lechler was elected a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in 1990, a fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists in 1996, and a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences in 2000. In 2012, he was made a Knight Bachelor for Services to Academic Medicine. <coughs> we are honored and pleased that Sir Lechler is speaking to us today on the topic of sustaining translational research. This is a very important topic to the academic hospital, such as our own, where we encourage our staff to be involved in research. Sir Lechler, welcome, please. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for being here at this early hour of the morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, share my thoughts with you, and a great pleasure to be here again uh, in Israel. The last time I was here, I was just saying, was June the 25th, 2016, which was the day of the result of the Brexit referendum, and my wife and I escaped feeling so depressed, but I thought, thought at least we're leaving this behind, and we came to Israel the only thing people here wanted to talk about was the Brexit referendum. Uh, here I am today, October 31st, the day we were meant to be leaving the European Union. So there's something about my connection with Israel and Brexit that I don't understand. So, let me start by saying that we have the privilege of being participants in a biomedical and health science revolution. I don't think that is overstating it. We're living in an extraordinarily exciting time. And let me just remind you of some of these fields that are moving so fast. So you know about the omics explosion. It began with uh, the sequencing of the first human genome. That took 10 years. It cost $3 billion. And now you can do a genome in a day for $600. And that continues uh, to be a falling price. And that's just genomics. And there's all the other omics coming along. And then, of course, the field of gene editing, which uh, is controversial because of some activities in China, but this undoubtedly is going to impact on a number of disease states, particularly those that are single gene disorders with somatic cell uh, gene editing and replacement. Um, that, of course, is paving the way for precision medicine, and that is well developed in cancer, but now extending to other disease areas such as diabetes. The digital revolution, which was rather slow to penetrate healthcare, but now is undoubtedly having a big impact, and I'll come back to that. The brain is beginning to reveal some of its secrets. Indeed, if I was starting again, I think I would probably do neuropsychiatry, because I think it's going to be such an exciting uh, area of medicine. And finally, my own territory of uh, immunotherapy. A number of cancers that 10 years ago we thought were untreatable are now treatable. Um, and indeed, the other side of the coin, autoimmune diseases and transplantation, uh, we're making real progress in turning the immune system off, as well as in cancer, turning it on. So it's an incredibly exciting time, and we are very fortunate to be working in this field right now. 
The other point I would make by way of introduction is that many of us, I'm sure many of you in this room, have grown up working in uh, mouse models. Uh, they've been very useful and informative, but increasingly now we can think of the human being as the experimental animal of the 21st century because we can do so many more things in patients than used to be the case. But just in case you thought the job was done, it's not done. There are some huge challenges uh, that we yet have to address. So there hasn't been a new class of psychiatric drug for 30 years. We have no effective treatment for dementia, one or two exciting recent reports. Uh, no new class of antibiotics for 30 years. No success in promoting tissue regeneration in situ. And the pandemic of obesity marches on. And there are many other challenges that uh, no doubt you are grappling with yourselves. So what I want to go through, and I'm going to move quite quickly, um, is what I regard as the key steps that we need collectively to take uh, if we're going to accelerate the translation of discovery into patient benefit. Um, and I'm not going to spend as long on each of these. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the first one, uh, which is maintaining a balanced science base. Now, in the UK, and I'm sure it's true in many other parts of the world, we keep an eye on the balance of research funding that goes to discovery science versus applied science. And this is uh, an example, it's slightly out of date now, but this is looking at how much research funding went to underpinning science, means basically discovery science, versus to uh, translational research. And, uh, you'll see that, uh, and some would point out, that actually there's been a shift towards translation. Some would say that's a good thing. Some would say, oh my gosh, basic science is at risk. So if you ask the question, is curiosity-driven research an unaffordable luxury? I think Carl Sagan, who was an American political uh, writer, uh, made an interesting remark that if we cut off fundamental curiosity-driven science. It's like eating the seed corn. We may have a little more to eat next winter, but what will we plant so that we and our children will have enough to get through the winters to come? So the way that I think about this uh, is informed by, um, uh, oh, before I come to that, yes, I'm sure you, you've all got your own favorite examples of where curiosity-driven research has led to very important uh, subsequent applications. So uh, the people investigating nuclear magnet magnetic resonance, resonance had no eye to scans at all. Um, they got the Nobel Prize for it, and of course it's opened up a new field of medicine. Indeed, when transistors were discovered, they were viewed as lab curiosities with no practical use. Uh, TAC polymerase, uh, green fluorescent protein, again, these were purely driven by curiosity uh, driven research, but have turned out to be very important in cell biology. And then the first person to clone a gene from E. coli uh, did it simply to see if it could be done and then warned against the dangers of genetic engineering. So we've moved on from there. Anyhow, I think a helpful way to frame this question and this debate uh, was provided by a guy called Donald Stokes, who was head of uh, a school of uh, political science, actually, in the US. And he d defined this very simple two by two um, square, where on the vertical axis uh, is how fundamental some research is, and on the horizontal axis, uh, how practical and applied it is. And he gave examples in each case. So for pure applied research, this is Niels Bohr, the Danish particle physicist. He had no interest in application, but of course some of what he discovered turned out to be applicable. For pure applied research, his poster child was Thomas Edison, the serial inventor who died with 1,096 patents to his name. And then what he called use-inspired basic science, his poster child was Louis Pasteur. The one quadrant you don't want to be in is this one in the bottom left, which is boring and useless science, but I'm sure there's no one in the room who sits in that quadrant. My argument would be that for those of us leading research institutions or research environments, such as the one you have here, 
The thing we need to do is make sure all three of these quadrants are occupied, that they're all thriving, but they're connected. And if we do that, then I think we have nothing to worry about. But it is important that all three are sustained. Um, now, if you think about whether this Donald Stokes was scoring highly for diversity with three white old men, I don't think he was, but we'll forgive him that. So, what I, the language I use is creating a research environment where scientists have line of sight all the way from discovery through to application. Uh, and so if I took you to King's College London where I uh, am in charge of all the health faculties, the basic scientists there would say, I like being here because even though I'm not a translational researcher, I know that down the corridor there are people interested in translational research who will take what I discover and apply it if it is applicable. So the key is to create close relationships between the users of research, so healthcare system, patients, uh, commercial entities, uh, and the drivers of research. And I think if we do that, then I think we'll get the balance roughly right. And of course, all of this drives what we in the UK call the Academic Health Science Centre model, and I'm going to come back to that uh, in a moment, because that is about linking the scientific push with the clinical pull, uh, so that you get the best of both. Now, you may or may not have heard of the Francis Crick Institute, uh, opened a couple of years ago behind St Pancras Station in London. It's a wonderful uh, building, um, and it's got some wonderful science going on inside, led by uh, Paul Nurse, a Nobel Prize winner, and then we've just got another Nobel Prize for Peter Ratcliffe for his work on uh, oxygen-sensing genes. But if you ask the question, is this just another Discovery Science Institute, I would say emphatically not, and the reason is that the unique thing about the Crick is that the three major London universities and their academic health science centers, so King's, UCL, and Imperial, are partners in the Crick. We each invested 40 million of capital into the building. That gives us each 80 body spaces to occupy to second staff into the building. And this provides three conduits for translational research from this powerhouse of discovery into these clinical environments. To my knowledge, this is a unique experiment uh, and one that I'm very optimistic will work well, provided that some of these basic scientists take the risk of coming out to work on our academic medical campuses to explore translational opportunities as and when they arise. So that's the first point. The second point that is absolutely essential is that we foster really close partnerships between universities and healthcare organizations. And the background to this in the UK is that these two entities, two sectors, have drifted apart over the last few decades for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that the healthcare system has become very preoccupied with targets. Uh, nothing wrong with targets, by the way. Uh, they've had a good effect in some ways. Um, and led by management rather than by clinicians. Again, nothing wrong with good managers. They're very important people. But that means that the R&D agenda has been secondary rather than primary. The university sector, we have something in the UK called the Research Excellence Framework. Uh, and it's easier to provide, to, to generate high quality research in basic science and in animal models than it is in clinical contexts. And so perhaps there's been a greater focus uh, away from clinical research. And the financial pressures, again, tend to drive organizations to focus on their immediate priorities rather than what is important in the long term. Now, I don't know whether this little joke is going to cross um, national boundaries. And so forgive me if it doesn't. I, I guess people here have heard of Winnie the Pooh and Piglet stories in their children, childhood. Um, so Pooh and Piglet were very, very good friends, uh, as you know. And here they are on what was called a woozle hunt, wandering around looking for a woozle. And as the two friends wandered through the snow on their way home, Piglet grinned to himself, thinking how lucky he was to have a best friend like Pooh. 
Now, this cartoon came around the internet at the time that the swine flu virus was identified. And Pooh was thinking less charitable thoughts to himself. And forgive the language, it's not mine. Pooh thought to himself, if the pig sneezes, he's effing dead. And so the swine flu virus put at risk uh, this very long-standing relationship. And I think our relationship between universities and healthcare, in the UK at least, has been under threat uh, for those reasons that I've just mentioned. So that it was that drove the UK to have a competition to designate a small number of academic health science centers. Uh, there are now six of these uh, across the UK, um, and they're designed to bring universities and their hospital partners into a much more intimate relationship in order to drive high-impact innovation into improved clinical outcomes and population health gain. So let me tell you uh, a little bit about the, King, the Academic Health Sciences Center that I lead. It's called King's Health Partners. It brings uh, three uh, hospitals together, Guy's and St. Thomas's, King's College Hospital, and the UK's leading mental health trust, the South London and Maudsley, uh, with the university partner, <coughs> King's College London. In my view, to be a 21st century academic health science center, you need to tick three boxes as a baseline. You need to be providing excellence in clinical care, excellence in research, and excellence in education. Uh, secondly, you need to be broad in your range of services and research. And thirdly, you need scale. So I think we can claim all three of those. Uh, we certainly are large. We have 36,000 staff and a turnover getting close to four billion pounds per annum with five million patient contacts and a very large uh, research portfolio. So there are three hypotheses uh, underlying what we're trying to do in King's Health Partners derived from the partnership, the partners in this organization. So if I'm talking to some innocent bystander at a bus stop, this is how I would explain what King's Health Partners is about. The first hypothesis is that by having two large acute hospitals, Guy's and St. Thomas's and King's College Hospital, in the same partnership, there must be an opportunity to reconfigure specialist services uh, and link the relevant research and drive up quality. It's a lot easier to say than it is to do, as I'm sure you well know. The second hypothesis is that by having a mental health hospital in this partnership, we should be able to do something to better integrate mental and physical health care. And the third hypothesis is that by having a university in this partnership, we should be able to create an academic culture and accelerate translation. So let me briefly illustrate whether or not we're making progress with delivering on those three hypotheses. So this is a diagram showing the specialist services delivered by Guy's and St. Thomas's, which are up here. These are two organizations, sorry, two hospitals, one organization on two sites. And this is King's College Hospital, three miles down the road. And you don't need to look at this very long to see that all these specialist services are duplicated. And if you were designing the healthcare system from scratch, you would not design it like this. And that's why I call this a dog's breakfast. It's a mess. And uh, this we saw as an opportunity to do something more intelligent about it. Now, as I say, it's an awful lot easier to say, let's reconfigure things than it is to do it, because nobody wants to give up what they have. But over the last 10 years, we've managed to make a lot of progress. And now we've committed consensually to developing a series of clinical academic institutes, consolidating cardiovascular and ch child health at St. Thomas's, uh, cancer and dentistry at Guy's, uh, neuroscience, uh, diabetes, and hematology at King's College Hospital. So we are reconfiguring services. We've done this in a very fair and balanced way, uh, and I think it has a lot of potential for driving improved clinical quality and translational research. So that's hypothesis one. Hypothesis two, I describe this as putting an end to Cartesian dualism. To understand that, you need to know a little bit of philosophy. So there's a French philosopher called Descartes uh, who believed in the duality of the mind and the body, thought they were two separate things. 
Philosophy has largely moved on from that thinking, but our healthcare systems have not. And so at Denmark Hill, this, uh, where King's College Hospital is on one side of the road, the Maudsley Hospital is on the other side of the road, and the relationship between these two wasn't very good in the past, and in, I'm told you needed a passport to cross the road between one hospital and the other. So this was uh, not sensible. And this is something I've become passionate about since leading King's Health Partners. The three drivers of this passion are shown here. I'm sure you know this. But by our own screening in King's Health Partners, almost a third of patients with long-term physical conditions are depressed. And rheumatologists are very good at looking after joints, but they're not so good at detecting or managing depression. The same thing for diabetes and so on. Secondly, 60% of patients referred to a cardiologist with chest pain have nothing wrong with their heart. It doesn't mean they don't have chest pain, but it means they get investigated inside and out until someone realizes that the problem was anxiety. And thirdly, patients with long-term serious mental illness, and this is the worst scandal of all, uh, have about 17 years taken off their lifespan, and this is not suicide, this is the physical comorbidities that accompany uh, their schizophrenia, and that's partly due to drugs, it's partly due to lifestyle. So we need to do something about this, and uh, this is a major theme across the whole of King's Health Partners. We're looking to do everything we can to integrate across these boundaries, and so we now have uh, 58 outpatient clinics which are co-staffed by a physician and a psychologist. We screen patients waiting in outpatients for mental health issues. We're training our mental health nurses to recognize insulin resistance and hypertension, and so on and so on. I think this is immensely important. What about the third hypothesis, that we're managing to integrate the university into the healthcare system and generate an academic culture? Well, this is one surrogate marker. This is a number of highly cited papers published by NHS employees in our hospitals. This is, these are not university employees, NHS employees. And this is when King's Health Partners was formed, and you can see it's trebled in Guy's and St. Thomas's and doubled in King's College Hospital. I can't prove that's due to the Academic Health Science Center, but I'm going to claim it as a credit. And then if you look at clinical trial performance, which we measure across all hospitals in the UK, um, Guy's and St. Thomas's is now either first or second, King's College Hospital fourth and 11th, and the Maudsley first or third for clinical trial performance across the whole of the UK. And 10 years ago, that was absolutely not the case. But these are surrogate markers, but I hope you'll accept they do provide some encouragement that we are generating a really academic, research-orientated culture in these hospitals. Okay, moving much more quickly now, the third challenge is establishing a sustainable healthcare system, because if our healthcare systems are not financially secure, there is very little chance that they will be able to prioritize research. And in the UK, that's a real challenge at the moment. So I think all of that drives this concept of value-based healthcare, which I'm sure uh, is alive and well here. But what we mean by value-based healthcare is measuring outcomes that matter to patients, services, service users, and their carers, divided by the resources, uh, including the costs, of achieving those outcomes over the complete pathway of care. That's the value equation. And we need really to focus on that if we have going to have any chance of a sustainable healthcare system. And so this is a major, another major cross-cutting theme across the whole of our academic health sciences centers. All of our clinical academic groups, that's the major clinical research constellations, have to produce outcome books, moving on to much more dynamic outcome scorecards. We do lots of communications around this theme. We work with local partners and so on. And I have a whole other talk on this, which I'm not going to give you this morning, but these are four categories of value-creating interventions that I can evidence for you are improving clinical outcomes at lower cost, and they're what I've talked about, service reconfiguration, pathway redesign, frugal innovation, and the most important value-based proposition of all, which is prevention. If we can manage to capitalize on some of the discoveries that I referred to earlier, for example, from genomics, 
polygenic risk scores identifying the high-risk sectors of the healthy population where we need to target interventions. I think those are the things we need to do if we're going to have a sustainable healthcare system. Uh, fourthly, fostering partnerships with industry, and that's something that I know you do exceptionally well uh, in this country, and I think it's really important uh, that we continue to drive that because the old model of drug development uh, is broken. It's when pharmaceutical companies used to have their own R&D in their own premises, and it became uh, less and less successful, and the returns on R&D investment uh, in the pharmaceutical industry just steadily declined, and the cost of getting a drug to market has steadily increased. And so we need new models, and that's happening in the UK, and I know it's also happening here. So Pfizer has its experiment with Centers for Translational uh, Innovation, where they're embedding Pfizer research groups in hospital environments. Uh, AstraZeneca doing the same sort of thing, GSK likewise. This is the Addenbrooke site in Cambridge where uh, AstraZeneca is putting its whole R&D headquarters right alongside the Addenbrooke's hospital. So I think these are models that we need to continue to drive, and of course we're trying to do that uh, at King's in London. In order to foster that more intimate relationship between industry and academia and healthcare, I think there are a series of steps that we can take. I think we need to involve industry and our undergraduate teaching. Uh, I think we need internships, so it's much easier to move between sectors. Uh, sabbaticals, I think, are a very good mechanism too. So I think a much more porous boundary between uh, our sectors is what we need uh, to be successful. So I often say that this is all about partnerships. We need partnerships between academic institutions. This is higher education institution and higher education institution. We're not very good at that. We tend to compete very often at the expense of collaboration. Uh, so in London, we're working very hard at getting better at collaborating. We then need partnerships between academia and healthcare, and then partnerships again with industry. And uh, if we get this right, then I think we'll have a tripartite relationship to deliver our tripartite mission. So in the UK, to finish this section, we're moving towards life sciences clusters uh, springing up around the UK. Again, it's something that, again, you've done very well in this country. Uh, and I think this is an intelligent way to organize uh, how things are shaped in a, a geographical region. Fifth point is absolutely crucial, uh, and that is making sure that we attract the most able scientists, both clinical and non-clinical, into biomedical research careers. And I don't know how it is in this country, but uh, it's vulnerable in the UK. The career pathway is insecure, uh, and we're at risk of losing people, um, not least actually because of the Brexit effect, of course, in terms of European uh, uh, scientists. I think we also need to pay attention to diversity in our uh, workforce. These are gender data from the UK. It just shows you how wrong we're getting it. Because if you look at clinical academics or non-clinical academics, uh, at the junior lecturer level, you can see it's roughly 50-50 male-female. But in the professoriate, it drops to about 20% women. And there's clearly something wrong there. Unless you're daft enough to think that women are less intelligent, uh, then we're simply wasting resource by not making it easy uh, for women to progress through academic ranks. And then we get into ethnic diversity where the data is even worse. The only other comment I would make is something that struck me when I was here three years ago, and that is that uh, my understanding is that universities do not tend to fund clinical academic uh, salaries for uh, research-orientated clinicians. Um, so you've got fantastic research institutions like the Weizmann and so on. You've got fantastic hospitals like Rambam here. But universities are not actually choosing to fund the salaries of clinician scientists, which I think is something that uh, might, you might well think about uh, addressing. Um, the sixth point is it's vital to build the infrastructure for what I call experimental medicine, because that biomedical revolution I talked about earlier is entirely dependent, if it's going to be translated, on having really first-class, safe facilities for doing early-phase trials uh, with these novel therapies in patients. 
and we've been working very hard on that uh, on our campuses. This is an illustration on the Guy's campus. Um, I don't know whether you're aware of the Shard. That's the tallest building in Europe, I believe. Uh, this is risen London Bridge, dwarfing the Guy's Tower, uh, which was uh, quite tall before the Shard was put up beside it. Uh, the Shard has also cosmetically challenged the Guy's Tower, which wasn't the prettiest building, so it's had a facelift. Um, but this building is turning itself floor by floor into an experimental medicine facility. Uh, and I've just seen a diagram of your discovery tower that uh, you're building here, and I'm sure it'll be something similar. But um, I'm not going to waste time going through each floor, but we have every kind of facility that you would want to do safely uh, first-in-man studies of advanced therapeutics, for example, uh, including GMP facilities, uh, genomics core, etc., etc. On the St. Thomas's campus, which is the one opposite the Houses of Parliament, there we're developing uh, a very exciting med tech hub where we're bringing biomedical engineering right into the heart of the hospital uh, and the plan is to create a London Institute of Healthcare Engineering and we've now got uh, 450 imaging scientists there and then we're broadening out to other aspects of biomedical engineering uh, over the next decade led by a very talented uh, young Frenchman, uh, Seb Orsolin. Um, and the, the thing that I'm particularly excited about here is that the engineering is really embedded in the hospital context, and I think that's uh, key. And we need to bring disciplines into medicine um, outside biomedical research if we're to make the progress that we wish to make. Uh, the penultimate point um, is to really get engaged with uh, the digital revolution, which uh, I'm sure you are, uh, and we are endeavoring to do so. It's going to have a very big impact, it already is. Um, so the possibility now of using this kind of technology for remote monitoring, which actually is having some very early dividends in low and middle income countries where you can monitor uh, retinal disease or skin lesions really in very primitive settings by transferring the data to uh, some central monitoring source. Um, but it's also relevant to the way we organize our healthcare systems. And hopefully this will lead to less dependence on trips to hospitals because we'll be able to ma manage patients in their home setting much more efficiently. Uh, lots of connectivity of data sets. I'm sure you're grappling with the data deluge uh, here in Israel, um, but it's really got huge potential uh, to extend our insights into disease pathogenesis uh, and uh, personalized medicine. And so, um, the applications of artificial intelligence are already having an impact uh, in uh, assisted diagnosis um, and uh, disease monitoring. Um, and so I think bearing that in mind, we need to think a little bit more creatively about how we're generating a workforce that can embrace some of these, uh, some aspects of this revolution that I started off talking about. And uh, we need to be breeding many more data scientists uh, informaticians and machine learning experts that are going to be comfortable working in the clinical context. So I think it also has implications for how we train doctors, uh, not only doctors but other healthcare professional groups too. And my final point um, is public engagement. It's absolutely vital that we take this aspect of our responsibility seriously. So I'm sure uh, as in the UK, when you complete your grant application, there's a little section at the end when you have to say what you're going to do about informing the public or disseminating uh, your discovery. And we do it as a kind of duty, uh, but we don't take it very seriously. I think we need to take it more seriously. Um, and the reason for that is that we need the public's permission, is the language I use, uh, to do the research that we do. Because ultimately, the public are the people that fund us through their taxes, one way or another. Uh, and as the biomedical revolution progresses, it's throwing up a number of uh, issues with ethical dimensions, and we need the public to engage with those ethical dimensions so, as I say, that we keep them on side uh, as agents working with us uh, as we continue to prosecute uh, the research that we want to do. So, to bring all this to a finish, um, what I've suggested to you is 
uh, that if we're going to harness this revolution that I started off talking about, we need to get a balanced science base, continuing to support discovery science. Uh, we need to build on this academic health sciences center concept to create line of sight from discovery to translation, bring academic rigor to healthcare sustainability, the healthcare sustainability challenge, create more porous boundaries between academia and industry, support the careers of young scientists so that they feel sufficiently secure to commit to such a career, address the diversity challenge, invest in key infrastructure, prioritize public engagement. I haven't talked about this, but I think it's also important we go on demonstrating to our government uh, the economic value of research, which of course I'm quite convinced is absolutely the case. So thank you very much for staying with me and thank you for your attention. <laughs>